So the name of this place is the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. And just like history is everything that happened before today, the humanities are everything that involves people. It seems to me the most useful knowledge that we could have. By exploring the human experience through art, music, literature, law, and history, we connect with people we've never met, go places we've never been, and discover ideas that are new to us. In doing so, our guest today believes we learn and understand more about ourselves and the world around us. Join us as we visit with Robert Vaughn, founding president of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Come on. The Virginia Foundation for the Humanities was established to bring together people and ideas. And one of the things that has distinguished us from other organizations that talk about bringing together people and ideas is that they always say, we bring together people with ideas. And we defined ourselves as we're bringing together people from all backgrounds, all walks of life, and ideas, because we want to bring the ideas together too. So that is the mission of this organization, and pretty much has been stated something like that since 1974, which is quite remarkable as I sit here and say that, because I'm still very, very young. <laughs> so let's talk about this from the beginning, because you are the founding president of the organization. What inspired you to start this, this organization? Well, I have to say that um, Edgar Shannon, who was the University of Virginia president at the time, said, I'm interested in creating something in the humanities. Would you be willing to come in and talk with me? There was not really a plan in place at that time. There was an idea. And we talked about maybe two and a half to three hours. And at the end, he said, Think about it. If you're interested, let's get together again tomorrow. And now this is the mm. largest humanities council That's by a long shot, right? By a long we shot, to say yeah. That? Um, I frequently will say we're more than twice the size of California, for example, or Texas, or Florida, or Illinois. And for the most part, it's about seven and a half times the average size of a humanities council in the United States the programming that we do and is that's, huge. And that's, right, huge. That's, that's what I want to talk what we about. Do. Yeah. yeah, so let's let's see. I know we can't possibly talk about everything that you all are doing here, but let's start with books and literature. What are the different programs that you have relating to that? It started with a book festival. Yes. But it has um, expanded at this point very happily from, I think, everybody's perspective here. We have a very large book festival that's annual, that's going into its 23rd year, and it's been a model for probably 20 other festivals around the country in different states. We also have an Arts of the Book Center. We create broadsides, uh, books. Uh, certainly one of the most fascinating was miniature books. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so that's been a way of a lot of fun. So coming into the festival as a new director, I was thrilled to see how many community partners we have. We love it when people come to us and say, here's an important conversation this community wants to have. And we can look for books, we can look for authors to help facilitate that conversation in a very civil and balanced way. You have wonderful programs relating to culture and community. Talk about that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The cultural aspects of the humanities, the literary, the historical, uh, the anthropological, I mean, this goes on and on and on. Uh, is central to everything that we do. We try to be as expansive and as broad as we can be. At the same time, we certainly want to be relevant to current events and right. current activities. Right. Um, and we want to bring people into the discussion. Yeah, um, well, you have <laughs> programs dealing with the African American community, the Virginia Indian program. The African American community was a priority of this organization beginning in 1974. We picked up the Virginia Indian uh, programming somewhat later. Right. That was a fascinating incident in that event when we started because we, just, we planned a, a conference for the eight state-recognized tribes. And we found out, and they found out, huh, that the groups had never met oh my goodness. before. The eight had never come together as a unit. But there, there were other things that that certainly one of the most fascinating things in the early stages in uh, 83, 84, uh, we decided to undertake some thematic programs. And the first of those was the Women's Cultural History Project, right. which was labeled a share of honor. It produced an extraordinary book 
a wonderful display. It was the largest non-art exhibit ever mounted in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And it was basically a history of women in the state. It created a whole research agenda for women's studies. You all have programs too that are all about documenting history. Talk about some of those. There's so many things that come to mind <laughs> that I hesitate even to start on. Oh, but, just uh, scratch the surface. <laughs> the Bill of Rights, the Courts, and the Law. Uh, we ended up producing three different volumes of that subject. We wanted to see what the Bill of Rights really contributed to American culture. Another, and this is sequential, there was that women's cultural history, there was the Bill of Rights, the Courts, and the Law, and the history of religious freedom, not just in Jefferson's creation there, but also as it played out in Virginia, and then in the United States, and then in worldwide. It gave me a great opportunity uh, to edit the book about it, and also an opportunity to teach on semester at sea oh. about the international impact of religious freedom uh, worldwide, 15 different ports. Oh my goodness. Uh, so I had a ball. Yeah, <laughs> oh my goodness. And then, so these are some of the projects and programs from, from the past, and but you all are very current and up to date, and you have your foot in the digital world as well. Talk about some of those programs. We do. Um, it really started with the Encyclopedia of Virginia, and it is a history, a, a culture, a business of Virginia. Uh, that was the first big digital-based project. Well, probably the single biggest user of the encyclopedia are schools. Right. In September, the encyclopedia is flooded with people, with students. The uses of the encyclopedia just skyrocket. And then in the end of May, they plummet. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> takes a break. Uh, yeah. But think about that. I mean, I, honest, I think <clears throat> about this a lot. I remember when I was growing up and you looked, you leafed through the encyclopedias and you were fortunate if you had encyclopedias mm -hmm. in your home. <clears throat> and now, you know what we have. So this is an amazing resource. It's been a lot of fun, too. It covers a pretty broad range of activities, and it, one day I assume it will be coming to a conclusion, but <laughs> it isn't going to be happening very soon. I mean, certainly there are three or four more thousand uh, entries that we want to create. And an entry is not just a 500-word article. It can be a 500-word article or a 1,000-word article right. or a whole s section on slavery. I mean, right. multiple entries, right. multiple photographs, multiple artworks. Poems. We've got, you know, Rita Dove speaking there. We've got Franklin Roosevelt traveling from from D.C. as president to the um, Shenandoah, where they were building the Skyline Drive, and that's really fun to watch because it's old timey rah rah history. Virginia, inspiring his forest army by a personal visit. President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Shenandoah Valley. You have radio programs as well. Yeah, you we started uh, with good reason, a radio program that focuses on what goes on at Virginia's public colleges and universities. It has expanded somewhat from that more narrow focus to uh -huh some private colleges and universities to other subjects along the way, but it is a Virginia-oriented uh, radio program. We were pleased, even a little surprised and taken aback, when Alaska Public Radio took it on as a weekly radio program. Yeah. The second radio program, which is actually somewhat larger in its scope, backstory with the American history guys, so it is not Virginia-oriented, it's American history-oriented. Right. And it cl includes uh, three truly extraordinary historians and extraordinary radio personalities at the same time. They're good program. From the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, this is Backstory with the American History Guys. No other state humanities council has done such a thing. It's created to be useful. You know, as well as entertaining. The idea is would, it would be good if we had some idea of why our politics look like this, of why our religious worship looks like this, of why you know, gender relations or race relations are like this. So everything is designed to answer a question, this is kind of strange, how did this happen? And the beauty of backstory is we get to tell some of those stories.
Talk just briefly <clears throat> about the scholarship programs and the grant programs. We started it in 84, but in 86, we welcomed our first group of fellows. For the most part, they are professors or other academic leaders from all over the country. And they spend a period of time with us working on a project in the humanities. Um, for the most part, those are books, but they're also exhibits. In fact, the photo up there of the, uh, the young girl, the dancer, was created with a whole exhibit. So it's a varied program. It's not just, you know, I'm going to write a book about Jefferson or right, whatever right, the way. Right. It's much broader than that. Okay, so are there a couple of moments that you could talk about or maybe achievements when you said, aha, I'm so glad I'm doing what I do? Oh, I mean, I and think I know that must happen daily. It happens to a lot of people around here, to tell you the truth. And <clears throat> I mean, one thing that we started in 89 is a folk life program, for example. Yes. That has been a rousing success. Right. We have been the organization that builds the Virginia stage at the, at the Richmond Folklife Festival, which is the largest folklife in the country right now, and I think was fabulously more successful than anybody ever imagined that it would be and that it would continue. So that has been, I've been quite enthusiastic about that. So when you retire, what are your hopes for the future? Well, I would be foolish if I didn't say, I hope this organization continues to grow as it has. <laughs> On the other hand, I want somebody to come into this position who has ideas. It's not static. We've never been static. Right. Um, so the development over time, we now have what we call 13 major programs. Maybe some of those will fade away and there'll be five or six or 13 new ones <laughs> along the way. So I hope that the organization will remain as vibrant. There's still people here who have been on this staff working here for 10 or 15 or 16 or 25 years. Yeah. Well, because they have responsibility, because they have freedom to develop. And, and because it's fascinating work. It is fascinating it's work. It's fascinating, I think Rob. It really is. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. Oh, this has been a treat. <laughs> There's no question about it. It's been a pleasure.